everybody. So hello, greetings, everyone. I'm Nate Angel. Um, you are attending the uh, Open Learning Journey MyFest 22 session titled Made by Students, Engaging Learners in Creating OER. And we have a couple of great guests and, and some students who were actually learners who were engaged in creating OER here today to talk with us, which is awesome. Um, I'm calling to you from what used to be sunny Portland, Oregon, but it's now raining again, as it often is. I really wanted to welcome you all here today. And to, before we actually dive into the, the formal program, I thought it might be nice if we could um, do a little uh, a little thing to kind of get to know each other a little bit better. Uh, now, normally, uh, when there's a bigger crowd, I, um, I actually have folks go into breakout rooms just with one or two people, but there's not that many people here. And I'm thinking that if we just do it kind of quickly, we might be able to uh, kind of get to get all get to know each other as a group um, uh, just together here in the room. And so um, if you will indulge me, um, I would love it if you would spend a couple minutes thinking about this prompt. Uh, so what is your earliest memory as a learner and or, and or what's the first thing that you remember learning? Now, of course, we learned a whole bunch of stuff before we might remember learning it, right? But uh, I'm kind of thinking of those moments uh, when we kind of maybe learn that first lesson, just sort of thinking about being a student and a lifelong learner. And as an example, uh, I'll go first. Um, I uh, I uh, remember when I was maybe about three or four, I think, I licked the top of a nine volt battery, one of those little square ones or those little rectangular ones, and uh, had a little experience, not too bad of an experience, but a, an experience that taught me a little bit about electricity and how it conducts uh, into my tongue. So that was that was like kind of one of the first indelible memories where I learned and I then I learned exactly why that happened because somebody took took the time out to to teach me about it. So I'm wondering um, who might to go, who might be willing to go next to talk about a, a, their earliest learning memory memory. Why don't we use the um, raise hands function um, under reactions in your toolbar if you want. Um, otherwise, I'll just start calling on people. Somebody want to volunteer to go next. Oh, Heather, yes. Yeah, I'll go next. I don't think it's necessarily the first thing that I remember learning, but like it's the first time I remember actually like sitting down and working hard to learn something. I was probably six and uh, I was taking tap lessons and I remember having the sheet of paper in front of me standing in the foyer of our house, which was the only place that we had like linoleum that I could tap on and I remember like okay a flap has two sounds flap, and a shuffle has three sounds or uh, has uh our shuffle step has three sounds shuffle step and so like I just I have that memory like deep down in my brain and uh yeah I, I like that you 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 were learning tap dancing but sitting down which seems like, yes. like a funny place to start <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Laura, you're, you're up. I have a really vivid memory from first grade, which is we had a substitute teacher one day, a young guy, and he came in and this was uh, early 70s. So we were learning math with the new math and we did everything with number lines where you drew a number line and you did the, the hops on the number line to do math. Well, he drew the number line on the other side of zero and said there are these things called negative numbers, minus one, minus two, minus three. And I was just enraptured and he was staring at the class and then he said, oh, I probably shouldn't have done that. And he erased it from the board and we didn't get to see that anymore. But I remember going home that night very excited and asking my dad, are there really numbers on the other side of the zero? That was a very exciting moment. There's, there's zeros on both sides infinitely, right? That's awesome. All right, Rissa, you're, you're, you're up next. And then we're out of hand. So other people need to think and, and raise their hands if they want to share. These are so clean. The first thing I can remember <laughs> like uh, learning was don't run on the wet pool decking because uh, you'll fall. You'll slip and fall. And then the other caveat to that is don't run naked on the wet pool decking because you'll get sunburned too it sucks on multiple levels wow that was like three so to be fair <laughs> but it maybe all happened in one event so 
Yes, it did, unfortunately. <laughs> How about our, uh, our special guest, Terry or Dave? Do you have a first learning memory? Sure, I could go. I just pinned myself by accident. Sorry Oops. about that. I was trying to raise my hand and I just showcased myself. I grew up in the Rockies uh, uh, in Banff, and I learned early that as you are chased around your house by a sibling, you should not look back at them as you're rounding a corner, but forward, or else you might get a face full of an elk belly as I T-boned a rather large elk who just looked at me like I was... Uh, nothingness, which was great, a great response. I was happy with that, uh, but scared the absolute crap out of me. And I ran away the other way. It's funny because so, yeah. I thought you were first describing being inside the house. I'm like, why is there an elk inside oh, the house? Oh, outside, but, sir. Yeah, yeah, outside, was, got it. A deer came in uh, my hotel room once though. So that was not without the realm of possibility. Anyway, that's me. Should I pick who to pass to? Oh yeah, let's do it that way since Ooh, people Har aren't raising their hands. Harmon, can I can I put you on the spot? Yeah, sure. So I just remember that I learned how to spell the spelling of Obidan. And because it's really tough for me, I was only six. And my mother told me that like just read it loud and spell the O B E D. And that was so deep in my mind. I still remember the things like how she used the way different ways to taught me that. And it was like really brilliant idea for me because I was really struggling around to learn the words and the different things like a big spellings of the uh, the th sentences and yeah I probably clearly remember it and it was still in my mind so that's all a good thing for me and shall I pass? Sure okay, if you so, feel comfortable. Uh, yep I'll pass to Kathy. My first memory um, goes back to, I have an older sister, and when I was younger, I always tried to keep up, and so um, she learned how to tie her shoes, and I remember sitting there next to my sister and my mother, um, and they were doing loop around, loop around, loop around, and I did it and did it until I got it. It was not a good tie of the shoe but at least I knew how to, you know, do the motions. So that's the earliest thing that I can remember learning. Um, Rebecca? Sure. Um, I was thinking my earliest learning memory was my uncle standing like really far in the middle of the swimming pool and me running to jump because I couldn't swim. And so usually the, the adults would be close. So I didn't have to jump very far, but here I had to like run and jump. And I ran and jumped and did a very great belly flop. And did that ever hurt? <laughs> and so I remember not to do belly flops when jumping in the pool. It's interesting how many folks are remembering uh, getting hurt as one of their first learning experiences. Like almost every story has involved that. I, I saw Lucy and, and, and Sybil shared in the chat. Um, what about Dave? Has Dave shared yet? I have not. <clears throat> I um, have been flickering back and forth and uh, Nate's warning that we're all doing injury stuff led me to um, similar if, uh, and also, I think was it Lucy who was talking about something they learned. Oh, how to spell library. It felt so guilty for cheating. Um, is another one of those things that, that put me in mind of it. I was in grade uh, one or kindergarten. And uh, I learned that just because everyone else is throwing erasers in classes, it doesn't mean you should throw them. Um, and I had inevitably took a larger eraser than the previous person and flung it very hard right at the same time the teacher walked in the classroom and uh, caught her in the side of the head, uh, which led to um, a lot of time in the corner and a whole bunch of other stuff. And I recognized that uh, I needed to have a better, uh, better handle on the power structures around me if I was going to subvert the process. Apparently throwing erasers at the teacher is not the best way to get started. Has it come full circle and someone's now thrown an eraser at you or? 
I've had some weird things happen in the classroom. <laughs> I don't get mad at them though. Yeah. I always remember that kid who just didn't quite understand what they should and shouldn't do. So tend to be a little bit. Meanness is really the only thing that frustrates me in classroom. Other than that, not a whole lot. Gets me riled up. Yeah, likewise. Is there anyone else here wants to know? Risha, I don't think you had a chance yet. If... So the earliest memory that I have uh, is I was in grade fifth and I didn't know how to cook. So one day my brother told me like, I can teach you how to cook pancakes. So he started and uh, the pancake was bigger than the pan. So <laughs> he started laughing, but he ate all the pancake. Yeah, he finished it. He was saying, it's awesome. It was your first attempt and it's awesome. <laughs> and I love that. Oh, that sounds like a, an awesome brother. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I wish I had a, I don't even have a brother. It sounds awesome. I have two brothers. Oh, yeah. nice. I, I'm only with sisters, so, which is also awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think maybe everybody's gone one way or another, except maybe Judith. Did you want to share an early learning experience? Hey, hello. Can you hear me? Uh, not quite. It's a little distant. Yeah, because perhaps because I'm in Finland. Oh, there it goes. There it goes. <laughs> okay, so I'm connecting from Finland, so perhaps that explains it. Okay. It's working great now. Good. Okay, so perhaps. It's a poem that I learned from my mom when I was about five about a postman coming early in the morning, knocking on the door. And I can, I still know the poem because my mother made an audio recording. So she taped it and I still have the recording so I can hear my, my younger self <laughs> and my, my younger voice. And it's so much fun. So. Yeah, that's a nice memory. Uh, I, is it a really long poem? Can you still recite it from memory now? Kikopoktat-i korán táskán val az oldalán, régi vendég télen nyáron, mégis szívtobogva várom, majd kirepett a alsója, annyi levél, hogy csoda, és amire itt a dél, célhoz él a sok levél. Can you wow. guess the language? <laughs> is it... Um... Is it uh, the same language that Beowulf was written in? No. <laughs> no, it's Hungarian. So oh, I live Hungarian. in Finland, but uh, I spent the first 40 years of my life in Hungary. Yeah. Wow, well okay. done. That's amazing. Is there anyone else who, it seemed like you had no trouble remembering at all, even after all these years, right? Maybe you practiced a lot in the meantime also. <laughs> Yeah, sure. <laughs> Thanks. Is, yeah. is there anybody else who didn't get a chance to share yet who wanted to share? I think we might have gone all the way around. Well, that was that was so great. Well, I'm just it's really interesting. It, one, one thing that I really took away from that is the situatedness of all that learning. You know, each each learning moment was just highly contextual in a place, and there was you know physical sensations and um, tastes. In my case, at least. Um, and in the pancakes, I guess. Uh, and it just reminds me of how much, you know, we sometimes divorce learning from the physical environment in which it happens and really how important that is for, for learning to stick. So just a thought I was taking away from that. <clears throat> so uh, maybe we should get on with, with the formal program then. Um, so uh, we, uh, the purpose of this first week in the open learning journey track here at uh, MyFest 22 is to kind of start to introduce ideas of open learning um, and explore the different directions and boundaries of it. We had a kickoff session. We had a session around, um, we had a, a session around uh, sort of, you know, epistemologies of power and how and how open plays in, in a world of, of, of power relations in the world. That was with Tasking Adam. That was, was really fascinating. Uh, and now we're um, switching to the topic of getting learners actually deeply engaged in open learning itself. And so we've invited a couple of folks here who were deeply involved in a program and some students who were involved in that as well. And I don't have information on the students, so I'll ask them to introduce themselves. But um, 
both Dave uh, Cormier and Terry Green are here. And um, why don't I pass the baton to you guys and you can say anything that you wanna say about the program that you, that you uh, were, were called here to talk about today, but then also give a chance for the students to introduce themselves so we can learn a little bit about them. Sure, Dave says I'm first, so I will do that. Uh, my name's Terry Green. I am senior e-learning designer at Trent University in Peterborough, Ontario, also known as Nogo Jiwanong, which is the traditional territory of the Michisagik Anishinaabeg. And um, so uh, over the last year, we created a project called the Liberated Learner uh, OER, and um, happy that we get the chance to share about it today. But before we go any further, Dave, should I, I'll introduce Risha and Harmon and then pass to you. Is that okay? Oh, I see the, yeah, cool. So uh, I'll, I'll let you introduce yourself, Risha and Harmon, but uh, Risha and Harmon are um, student uh, co-designers, co-op uh, co students who are, co this is their completion of their uh, work at Lam Lambton College uh, in the e-learning design program. Uh, I taught both of them in a course, just one, I think not two, um, and now they're they're finishing off their work to uh, as co-op students with us throughout this summer. And uh, Risha, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, my name is Richa Gansal, and I am uh, pursuing my e-learning design and training development from Lambton College, and I have eight years of teaching experience in India. I was teaching English and uh, I have two kids and uh, they are in India. I'm just waiting for them badly. When when will they come? Um, I don't know. They hadn't got oh, their visa yet. So not I'm just sure yet. Hopefully it's yeah. soon. Yeah. And Harman? Yeah. Hello, everybody. I'm Harman and I'm in the same course as Richa in, and I'm also a student of Lambton College. And I'm pretty excited to be here because I learned a lot of things in my co-op that I didn't learn from my academic year. And I'm a mom of five year old and I'm pretty excited to share this news because my husband and my kid will be coming next month to Canada. And I'm pretty excited for both. Yeah, it was like really long and I waited for them like almost one and a half year to be here with me. And it seems like all my patience is like paid off. Fantastic. Yeah, thank you. And now we'll pass it over to you, Dave. So uh, my name is Dave Cormier. I'm at uh, the University of Windsor. I'm a learning specialist here, do uh, digital strategy and special projects. And one of those special projects was working on uh, Terry's brainchild called the Liberated Learner Project. It was, it involved uh, four different universities that came together, or no, seven different universities that came together to work on four different modules that just popped into the chat room. So it was this whole idea that we had that we were going to try to come from the learner's position in terms of what their actual legitimate challenges were rather than um, the challenges that are perceived upon them, right? So we started from the students first. I was fortunate enough to have um, I think over the over the pandemic, I had 70 some co-op students working for me, uh, but they weren't students who normally select their way into working in something like the Office of Open Learning. They were students who would normally be working in their own co-op field, but because of the pandemic, uh, they ended up working uh, with us. So they were what you might call regular students in the sense that, uh, unlike other places where I end up working with students who self-select in, so you get kind of this. Kind and an, an overly invested group that doesn't necessarily reflect the rest of the student body, certainly with the students I had, they were reasonably broad, broadly based across the campus. And uh, the first thing that they did was did a, a survey of uh, a bunch of other sites that were meant to help students with the challenges they had. And they came back and went, this is the same nonsense we've been told since we were in grade 10. It's all the stuff that doesn't actually apply to us. So we started from that place. And then uh, we work with those students to start talking about the things that they were actually concerned about. Um, and uh, we, it was a really sort of involved six month process of digging into student story. Uh, we did a lot of story work where we had students dig into their own experiences. Uh, less, hey, do you have this kind of problem? And more, tell us a story about something you really struggled with. And uh, the stories we got back, I think were really powerful. 
um, really surprising in some cases where the challenges really were. In other places, things that you would expect. And uh, this is, I will say, because Terry won't, this is all his brainchild based on a previous project that he did. And uh, he's the one who guided us through this whole process. So why don't you tell us about the rest of the process, Terry? <laughs> I just shared uh, a link to the, the stories, the wicked problems. Um, yeah, I got to say, when you're the project lead and the other, other people in the project are Dave Cormier, Jenny Heyman, Julia Forsyth, Joanne Kehoe, uh, Pat Mayer, it's, it was a little scary, but, um, <clears throat> oh, that's a Alan Levine splot, just by the way, the, the wicked problem site. Um, using his open open uh, splot technology. Anyway, um, it's almost been a year since the design sprint we held for the the wicked problem stories, and um, it was, I think, a big. It, it was when we. <laughs> what am I trying to say? When we doubled down and made sure we were truly co-designing with students. Uh, not only like we listened to Dave's students and said, yes, we need these, we need to find these actual stories. So yes, we need to find the wicked problem. So we we scheduled the, or organized the design sprint. Um, but then to also hold the design sprint in such a way that our student co-designers facilitated the drawing out of those stories during the design sprint was why we got the good stuff instead of the what they think we think we want to hear kind of stories um and then so i like that that act i think was the turning point or the like point where we truly were getting co-design for real and and getting at what we're going for in finding um the stuff that students need to uh it, to search for to, to to be liberated and i think that's the key first insight certainly in the work that that i've done and I'm, i hate to talk about the story of laura here but uh because i think of her as the master of that but the the biggest challenge that i find with students is that there is uh, at least 12 often 15 years of training where they have been taught that there is a right answer to questions and that what their what success looks like for them is for them to figure out what I want them to say. And then once they say the thing I want them to say, they go ahead and say it and their job is done. Right. So what they're going to do is say, OK, so uh, tell me what you want me to do. And then I'll say, I don't know. I don't even know you yet. And you know, this weird situation back and forth. At any time you engage in an open process with students, they don't know that you're really doing this. Right? They don't believe that this is really happening to them. Because as one student told me uh, last summer, no adult had ever asked them a question without already knowing the answer. Right, And that's, that's the square one place that you're starting from. So the first thing in any of these processes where you legitimately want students to co-design, not when you want to put on your CV that you've done a co-design, but when you actually want to do it, there's this whole process of deconstruction that needs to happen where you create a number of different circumstances where students, because I mean, they have their individual thoughts. They just, like me with my eraser, was they're not rewarded for having original thoughts. Because often creativity or whatever else is really messy in a classroom. It's annoying in a classroom. It gets punished in classrooms because it's unexpected and is not what the teacher actually intends. So that whole process, and that's one of the things we were really passionate about in this project, was trying to continuously go back to trying to explain to students that we didn't want, we didn't have a preset answer that we were looking for. We didn't have a clear path we were trying to follow. We were trying to get to the story that they had and then act upon that story. And, um, you know, there's, I'll find, I'll pass over, I'll pass back to Terry. I'll find an article that I use pretty regularly. Um, it's called The Curse of the Teenage Learner. It's a really nice, uh discussion article to talk about how any kind of change you want to make or any kind of approach you want to take and i think openness is one of those places really involves a culture shift far more than it involves a pedagogical shift right you need to deconstruct that existing culture of power you know you're saying you're talking about power in your previous conversations deconstruct that culture of power being a one-way street 
create a sense of safety, create that space for like genuine creativity, not the nonsense. I call it in the lines in a colorful way, creativity, but the real stuff so that you can actually have a co-created project. Right? It's way more work. And it can be really frustrating. And the best part is, is it won't always work. Sometimes you'll not get that trust, no matter how hard you try, right? It's risky. Wonder Har oh, sorry, Dave, I didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead, no, I'm done. I was gonna ask like Harmon and, and Risha, did, did you have that experience that Dave was describing where you, you, weren't, you didn't really realize that you were there to co-create? So I should contextualize Risha and Harmon's uh, participation in this they're okay. actually the only ones currently working on it <laughs> anymore it. um so they that and this was a, a great benefit of of the access to all the people at all the seven institutions was that people could come in fresh at different times and so risha and Harmon have come in fresh like after the funding time was up in in overtime basically to um like i first just asked them to do a a review of it an evaluation of it uh, and and now they are adding kind of a missing piece that we weren't able to do, and it'll be hugely helpful, I think, in allowing this thing to get used out there. Is they're creating from the press book a LMS course cartridge, so that institutions that want to take advantage of it can just grab it and pull it in. I'm gonna have to jump out for two seconds to help uh, Hattie, but. Harman, Risha, do you want to perhaps just share your response to, to seeing it and, and what you, see, you thought you might get out of it? I'll be right back. Say hi to Adi. Yeah, so this is my very first experience when I'm like working on this type of course and I never heard about the press book before, but after learning all the things and working on it, like it's pretty good thing to learn about the new things and I learn uh, most of the stories and the they share the personal experience and the daily activities and the final thoughts and everything. So it's like pretty good. Awesome. Yeah, uh, I, we are working on like Liberator Learners press books. So it's a great experience and we learn a lot of things, design elements, and there are a lot of things to, to learn from that icons, text, and there is a lot of variety like to learn from these press books, yeah. But has your learning been uh, technical, I imagine, in some cases, like learning how to use the tools, but are there other learnings too that, that actually involve pedagogy or, or writing or other, other skills that beyond the technology? Uh, yeah, I just got like lots of new ideas, like how the things want to work in actual online courses, because it's my very first time to working with like any kind of uh, these type of courses. And I think I learned a new thing that how the far technology goes from uh, just uh, that uh, sitting in the classroom and listening to your teacher and how the thing, things change, like you can do on your own, you can learn your own uh, new things and someone does guide you how you're gonna working with through all the different elements and how you create the courses, how you like uh, um, grab all the content and make them a one specific syllabus or template, we can say. It's pretty good experience for me. Like I'm learning, I'm daily learning a new thing. Yeah, I'm pretty excited for that because I never imagined that I can work for like any kind of big university, like as a co-op student. Yeah, it was like my very first interview and I'm pretty excited when I just started and it's going really well. Has it, has it changed your vision about what you might do in your studies or in the future? Oh yeah, it changed a lot because in my academic study, I just learned the things that my teacher told me, like do this thing. I'm just like, basically I'm just copying my teacher because he told me this thing and I'm just copying this. And right now I'm just learning the things that how I should do my own, like putting my creativity or putting all my efforts, like learning my, by my own and putting my ideas in the things and just waiting for the like, so Terry can, uh, you know, give me permission to change the thing so he should like, like it or not. So he can give his review so I can change the way he wants. It's pretty look like I'm doing a job, but actually it's my co-op. <laughs> Do you, do you find it liberating or scary or both? Um, I really don't know. Or something else but, maybe. But, but <laughs> I just say like, 
uh, when I just started, because I'm pretty confused because it's a very first experience when I'm really working with these things because in my country, we can't get that kind of experience. And we even we don't have that kind of a technology so we can put our ideas. We have to like go out from our home, like going moving to the metropolitan cities to learn that experience. But I'm really happy and glad that I make my decision to come in Canada and learning these new things. Yeah, it's pretty exciting. I can't explain actually. <laughs> what about you, Risha? Is it has it what what emotions have gone gone happened for you in participating? Yeah, when I started, I was literally scared. I was like, what I'm going to do in this go up and uh, how I can do that? Because uh, when we were studying, uh, we were just doing the things in storyline and rise, but it was all new for us. So I was just I was totally scared, but Terry guided us like anything. So he told us what to do and how to do, how we can change, how we can uh, show our creativity. And also it's really new experience for me. So uh, like if I would get a chance to do this further, I would love to do this because when I start doing work on these things, on making the modules, designing the modules, I love to do that. I always like my time passes like anything so it's 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 awesome wow well dave and terry i don't want to you you guys may have some more things you want to get across or or talk with with the students or perhaps we should um you know we could also open up the the rest of the the crowd gathered here for their thinking and thoughts and questions i for prefer sure. to monopolize the conversation yeah, if i could i was Nate. just going to uh talk for 23 more minutes myself if that's okay or dave if you want to i'm just kidding <laughs> as long as that is okay <laughs> i do have She's one more enough. example i want to show if i can um so uh interestingly just as this project was um was pulling itself together not that we did it all at the last minute or anything not like it just nah. slow and steady um, so actually, we did pretty good, I think. But um, I had a faculty member who had been involved in one of the other collaborative projects we did who came up to me and said, I have a classroom of 200 students and I want to do a collaborative ebook. So, how can I actually do this? Because I want them to get involved in that process. So, this is the outcome of that project. It was neat because one of the other challenges, I think, in this environment is that you're going to end up with some students who, particularly as the content gets more challenging, and you'll see when you click on that book, some of the content there's pretty deep, some of it's pretty challenging, some of it is um, pretty personal to those students. And you don't want to get to the point where you, if you want to be open, you also have to be open to it not being open, at least I believe. Um, the idea of forcing students who are in my class into a box where they have to actually put all their stuff publicly is not one that I'm comfortable with, though I've heard arguments that, that make sense to me where people see things differently. Um, in this case, we created two. We created two different pathways. One of them was went to public publication, and one of them went to a private ebook, which I'm not showing you um, because it's private. Uh, but they uh, both groups had to do the same amount of work. They had to do the same process. They had to go through the same development. We had to do the same deconstruction. Past the what is it you want me to do towards a because it's a balance too, right? If you're getting people to build a page, they have to understand how the web works. They have to understand how web writing works to some degree like i don't need them to do it in a specific way but there's some things that just don't work um so you got to go through some technical didactic processes where you're like yeah and then also stuff like uh i'm perfectly happy being didactic about you putting alt text on your images but i don't i don't feel like i need to have a conversation with you about that i want you to put alt text on your images because it's more accessible to other people so that's me telling you what to do and yet I want this other stuff where you're actually coming up with your own opinion too. So uh, we're working on a paper right now that describes this process between a faculty member and I and as we went back and forth and how her pedagogical principles and mine sort of balance back and forth through this, trying to see how, you know, in practice, how this legitimately happens with somebody who came to me and went, I want to do a thing, but I don't really use the internet. Um, and because uh, she'd heard it on, um, uh, this one of the higher ed podcasts. She'd heard about something like it. I think it was Alan Levine who was talking about it. So 
it's hard. And this is just to some of the conversations earlier, can this be done in other contexts? You can do it. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of investment up front. It's a lot of changing of your own practice. There's more risk involved in teaching this way, certainly at the start. Um, I never, I 100% want to say that if you're contingent faculty or a contingent educator who does not have a permanent position and are not financially stable, I don't uh, advise that you take giant risks in your teaching approaches. Um, people still need to keep their jobs and, and like, so I think there's a lot of things involved in this. Um, all that being said, this was a really powerful project for the students involved. Um, it was a really eye-opening project for the faculty member in terms of the process. And I think the outcomes of it are, are really powerful as well. So, I mean, openness, I think getting students involved in openness is, um, is a really powerful tool, but there are a lot of ethical questions that you need to ask uh, yourself about, about the student data, about what they're doing with disclosure, about whether or not they understand what kind of disclosure they're making, uh, about where that content's gonna go, how long it's gonna be there, um, and as well as your own position in the process as well. So um, I'm not trying to, well, I guess in some cases I am trying to discourage you from doing it. It just depends on your situation. And I think it's important to have that conversation because I can say, oh yeah, it's super great. But the truth is um, there are a lot of pieces to the puzzle. Terry, the project that Terry and I worked on had $200,000 in funding. The one that um, well, not real dollars, Canadian dollars. Um, the one that $35,000. Yeah. The one that, uh, I worked on with Kathy or with, um, the one I worked on with Catherine was not funded, uh, but still had some student support in the process from that I took on from another project. Um, so there's a lot of heavy lifting and a lot, of, if you're going to get the students to do their own content, there's a lot of training there as well. And there's a lot of front loading to get this stuff sorted out. So it's not an easy job in that sense, but uh, it can be a super, super powerful one. And you don't have to do all the things. I think that's the, the last point I would wanna make for people who are trying to do this. You can do a little tiny project on a little tiny thing. And I heartily advise you to start small in these things um, and then build on those skills so that your skills develop so that moving forward, is that you don't want people building on their skills, Terry? No, sorry, I was laughing at Rebecca's. Uh, how can how can students learn if you don't take away marks? Well, I don't know. Here in Harmon and Reese's co-op, there's no marks. There's them getting paid and they're learning. It's funny. I was told that. Yeah. As I was an adjunct, and I had given a lot of students a lot of high grades because. It actually said in the instructor guide that it was possible to get 100% and it was mastery grading so students could keep handing things in. So I gave away a whole bunch of 100% and then got my hand slapped for doing it. And one of the comments where I stopped, I actually just decided that I wasn't going to continue the conversation was when they said, how can students learn? How can students learn if you don't take away marks? I'm like, I think we're coming from a completely different philosophical world. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Dave, didn't mean to interrupt you. <laughs> no, no, it's probably best. You know me, Rebecca, once I get started, I'm, there's only there's only interrupting me. Um, I put in the chat a link to a video that our uh, multimedia designer did, uh, James Bailey. It's just a great video that covers kind of everything, how it was all made. And I just, I want to make sure to mention, because it's the funnest part that because we were creating it for learners by learners with Ontario provincial funding and we wanted students at every part. We were able, we were able to pay some students to create beats to study to from one of the uh, college programs that creates, uh, it's an independent music production programs. Um, and so they're like, you know, there's these, all these ch chill lo-fi hip hop beats to study to out there. So we had our own made for the for the project so people who at every start of every module there's a link to them say hey listen through the beats as you go through the module and when the playlist is done maybe take a break kind of thing so it was, that was just my my kind of favorite part 
not favorite part, but I think a nice icing on the cake kind of part. I'll get the link for it. And just so you know, I've been um, <clears throat> updating the slides with all materials that you guys have been sharing and they'll make them available to everybody. Of course, in fact, I will just share the link to them right now. Uh, Thank you. So that all these things will be collected for you in one place and you won't have to go searching for them later. Thank you. I was just thinking further on the, can you do this with younger or adult students question earlier? I think one of the other things that I would heartily encourage people is to not get tangled up in the technology. Um, none of the technology that you're going to use here is going to solve any of these things. So if you have something that allows you to do shared documents, like a Google Doc or something, all of the things, 97.5% of the literacies you're looking to develop, the collaboration, the how do I deal with uncertainty and how do I, like, all happens in the same way. If you can take out all of the overhead that comes from getting accounts and logins and the rest of that stuff and focus on something very, very simple from a technological standpoint for your starting place, if you want to do something super cool later, that's fine. But make the, the barrier, take away all the barriers for entry that you can. Um, you know, rightly when it came out 17 years ago, it was still one of the most powerful educational tools I've ever seen. And it's carried forward in Google Docs and other platforms that do the same thing. It's them working together that's powerful, them working off of each other, them confronting their own challenges and not having a right answer, but choosing to work anyway. That's what you're looking for. Whether it's in some kind of cool book or not is like, should be like your fourth consideration. Although I've, 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 I've often wondered, oh, sorry, you were going to say something else? I just, I think I, just Lucy's hand is up. Oh, gosh, Lucy. I'm sorry. There's so many different That's things. It's okay, I could wait. No, no, you should go. <laughs> I was wondering if anyone here has any advice for doing this outside of formal academic or school learning environment, because I don't have a ready-made cohort of students I can experiment with, as in alongside and with them rather than on them. Um, so I have to recruit people to something before I can start designing it, if I'm co-designing it, or, you know, just any ideas about where to start in that context. Do you have any budget to like feed, feed them? <laughs> I don't know. I Offer have no food? budget. I'm, no I'm earning less than minimum wage right now. Oh, wow. so not, I could look for funding, but I just get so frustrated at how, how long that takes. I'd rather just crack on. So not, not maybe. Advice... Sorry, please don't turn off your microphone. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Um, the best advice I ever got was um, running a project like the one you're describing is the difference between uh, doing a painkiller or a vitamin. So vitamins are things that you take every day because they make things a little bit better. And those are really easy to do inside of a formal structure because people already have to attend and they already have to get a course and they already have to do those things. If you're working outside of that, and I've certainly run courses outside of university structures before, some of them large courses, some of them small courses, and have built a number of communities over the years. It's about finding that thing that people really need to have solved, that thing that they really need to do, right? So if you can find something where you're actually solving a problem that people legitimately have, whatever that field is, then um, running a collaborative community that actually creates an ebook that answers a question or solves a problem can be really powerful for that community. They all are served by being involved in the creating of it because their names end up being on it and they're actually solving a problem they legitimately have. So if you can find that thing in whatever field, and I don't know where you come from, but whatever field or whatever thing you happen to be trying to do, um, find that thing if you can legitimately explain to people how being involved in the process is going to help them solve their problem. Um, and then the thing that you build ends up being the thing that you're working on collaboratively together to solve the problem, then you're cooking with gas. It's so no, I was also wondering, for you. Hey, Lucy, you got your hand up again, right? Yeah. You don't have to raise your hand every time. No, take your hand down. I, you know, I was wondering if Laura Gibbs, who's I know is here in the group, 
Uh, Laura, I feel like you've done so much work that has sort of extended outside the boundaries of the normal institutional walls, the ivory tower walls, if you will. Um, and I know you're doing even more of that now in your new chapter, um, working with the Internet Archive and just continuing your fantastic work. I wonder if you have any uh, thoughts on what Lucy was asking. Well, I, I thought Dave's answer was just great. And it made me think of a, a little chat book that Martha Burtis had put together on, on grading. Uh, and I'd uploaded a copy of that to the Internet Archive. So I put a link in there, but she did it as a physical publication. It's just a, a small chat book. I think it's around 20 pages. But, you know, it's it's this theme of small is all that we heard about in the emergent strategy. You know, I think it is amazing. This liberated learners is big and sprawling and it's got all kinds of stuff going on and you can just see and imagine the huge amount of work that went into it and that's great but you can also have really transformative writing experiences and publication experiences on a small scale too like Martha's little chapbook shows and I was also going to put in a pitch for a really neat book that uh, is a piece of research that came out of the University of Oklahoma and two other schools called Meaningful Writing. It's the Meaningful Writing Project and they published a book. And if you're just wondering about, you know, what kind of writing is meaningful for students, which is, you know, what's going to give them the motivation to do the good work and not just for their grade and to invest that time and uh, creating something lasting and useful. They just asked graduating seniors, what is the most meaningful writing you did in college? And then followed up on what the students said. And it's a really eye-opening book. So I want to, I, take every opportunity I get to recommend that to people, the Meaningful Writing Project. If you have a link, I was looking for it, Laura, but if you have a link for that. Yeah, I, it's um, you can snag it at, at Amazon or whatever. I'll put a link in the chat. I found a JSTOR link. Maybe it's the wrong yeah, thing. Yeah, I think it, it's available through some of the um, uh, like academic text sharing things. I've never quite really figured out who has access to it that way, um, but there is a book. And so I put the link to the book there and they're working on a, a follow-up book that is gonna take the, the things they learned as a result of this research project and turn it into some practical sort of recommendations, uh, sort of you know how-to guides. I don't know what the, I think they're gonna be publishing that with West Virginia University Press in that same series as the ungrading book, but I'm not sure when it is coming out. And also I just have to say, I love press books. I love seeing every time I see a press book, I poke around and see what new things I can learn. And it looks like you guys have done all this great stuff with uh, HP5 in there. And it just, uh, oh, it looked really, really cool. So I was looking at the motivation page and the games that are embedded on that page and the great diagram and just the, I know all that multimedia takes so much work, but wow, I mean, it, it just looks fantastic and really engaging. There's some pretty epic use of the documentation tool in the navigator module for the H5P. Wait, the documentation tool sounds so boring, but it's actually really cool and powerful. Can you tell us why? Because that's a really boring name. Yeah, it's a boring name for sure. But like you can, it just allows you to walk through, you know, fill in your answer to this, fill in your answer to this, walk through a few pages and you just kind of pick away at your answers to things. And then you can export it as a Word document or a PDF into something structured like your answer to whatever. And then you take away a document that is your time management plan or whatever it is. I can't remember right now. It was, I think, pretty powerful. It needs a, fit, a fun, more fun name, though, for sure. Yeah, we're really enjoying uh, how you have a little siren in front of you. <laughs> Not a siren like a police siren, but like a, a little singing siren. Yeah. Hello, singing siren. What's the first thing you remember learning, Hello. Hattie? <laughs> Hello. Hattie? Did I have a question for you. I don't know if you can hear. Maybe your dad's earphones. You can hear. Yeah. Can you hear me, Hattie? Hello. Hattie, do you hear Nate? Hi. Say hi. What, what's the first thing that you remember learning? <laughs> Have you learned anything yet? No, no. Nothing. Awesome. Nothing. One day. Yes. No. No. You went to the aquarium yesterday. On my birthday. On your birthday. She just turned four. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> Did you learn anything at the aquarium? Ooh. Oh yeah, we lost her stuffy. Oh. We 
the obviously the prices at the gift shop were absolutely outrageous. We bought the smallest thing, mediumest thing we could, and immediately lost it. So that was great. Was it eaten by a whale? I want to find it. We'll find it. I want to. I want to get one again. We'll yeah. see about that. Um. Awesome. Sorry, we have derailed everything. Yes. And a lovely derailment. I do see we are nearing, but I only recently learned what the top of the hour actually is. It's when the big hand reaches the top of the clock. I don't know if anybody remembers those old clocks that had hands, but um, the top of the hour is when the big hand reaches the top. And I guess everybody else probably knew that earlier. Uh, but we have about five more minutes before we're set to go. And I'm wondering um, if uh, if Risha <clears throat> is still here, um, is it is it true that you get to continue to work on the project um, or is it, does it come to an end because of a term ending or something, or does that depend on whether you keep have the work study situation or co-op student situation? Uh, it depends on co-op because once our co-op will be finished. So yeah, it depends if they are getting hired again or not. I see. But the, like you're almost done building this uh, course cartridge, um, so we'll yeah uh, we might brainstorm what else we can do on that project. But um, we've got other courses to build as well for sure. Yeah. So your work is far from done. Yeah. And is that a course cartridge that you all will be distributing that other people might be able to use in their learning environment? Yeah, that's the idea. Like we, you know, the press book is open and there's all the downloads for you to take it and everything, but there's no like way to throw it up into a, an LMS. That was our kind of last thought. But now we you know, now that we have everything else is like might be Hello. if a if a an uh, institution wants to try to offer it as a, a course or something to just pull it right into there. So you'd be able yeah, it will add it to the downloads list. And this is great because it gets Harmon and Risha on the list of contributors as well for them. And um, you know, you could pull it into Blackboard, Canvas, uh, Desire to Learn, all those other ones. When will it be released? I don't know, within a month or two, probably. We'll just add it to that downloads page. That downloads page is linked from the uh, link right in the slides already. So, Patty Goals. <laughs> well, <laughs> hello again. Happy birthday again. So, uh, Dave. Uh, any, a lot of really interesting conversation here. And I actually, I keep connecting it back to the conversation we had with Tusky and Adam uh, two days ago now. Um, just think, just being really intentional about learning design from the, from the start and all the things that you have to like let go of and think about differently. If you, if you don't want to just have a, a course that's about liberation, but a course that is or, or an experience, we should say, probably, that is truly liberating and the difference between those. Um, and so it really seems like you guys have been exploring that, that, that uh, difference. It's all about the people, right? So I wouldn't even say learning design, I would say community design, right? So it's about creating an environment where there's room for power that isn't yours. Um, and all the deconstruction for the old white dude in all the places where I'm accustomed to having power and speaking for power and interrupting poor Lucy earlier, which is still something I'm working on. Um, but trying to find space inside yourself for other people, not just their voice, but their mistakes, right? So it's easy to find space for other people and what they're doing is awesome the first time they do it or what you expect, but that's not what you get in a co-design, right? You get all, you get everything. Good, the bad, the weird, the stuff that might be good, but you're not close to it enough has nothing to do with you. So it might be good for them and not for you. All that stuff, right? Creating an environment where that's okay. I dropped in another project. Um, I just was going to drop it in at the start and I recognized that Reclaim had uh, suspended that account. So I re-upped it while we I were talking. I just had to pay one too because I just was reminded. And managed to post it during the conversation. So I'm happy to nice. get it in before the end. Those are all student-created projects that were done um, outside of the uh, classroom, but they're all sort of things that students did to try to help other students. Maybe Lucy Thanks can draw on that as well. Great. Great. Uh, Hattie, any last thoughts? Hattie, any last thoughts? Nope. 
Nope. nope. Okay. Terry. Um. Oh, I was. I just want to say, like, the liberated learner wouldn't exist without, like, Robin DeRosa's open anthology of earlier and uh, American literature and Laura's work and like open work makes something like this. Like hopefully this could be added to the list of things that shows that co-design works great, but it's uh, it only exists because of other open co-designs that's been done before. There we go. Makes sense. Well, I we have truly reached the top of the hour now. So I really want to thank everybody. This was a really enjoyable session for me. I hope you, got, you all had fun as well. Um, and we'll be sharing, of course, the slides, which have all the links from the chat in it and uh, the recording uh, moving forward. Um, and uh, Risha and Harman, thank you so much for joining. I put space for you to um, edit some slides yourself. And of course, you can you can make other spaces. You have full control. So do whatever you want in the slides if you wish to or delete them if you if you wish as well. Uh, and I really thank everybody for coming. And uh, please come to other MyFest uh, sessions if you can. Um, it's a pay-as-you-can uh, event, so no one should be barred from, from joining any session. Thank you. Hattie, you want to say bye one more time? Bye. 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 Thanks, That's a Nate. great note Thanks to end on. Hello. Bye. <laughs> you want to I want just session. I liked Heather's suggestions, just sessions with Hattie and small ones. Yeah.